So uh, welcome, everyone, um, for this uh, new edition of TCS Plus. We're very happy to have uh, Christos Papadimitriou from Berkeley talking today. Before we start, a few announcements. Uh, so the first thing I think every one of you is aware of is that we're changing a little bit the way we communicate with each of you, we're sort of moving away from the TCS Plus page on Google Plus to the use of uh, email and email lists, which will be more convenient. So I hope everyone who's listening to me has signed up for the TCS Plus underscore announce um, mailing list. If you have not, please sign up because announcements will go through that mailing list. Um, everyone who's watching the talk, you can watch the talk. It's streamed live on YouTube. You can watch it on YouTube, but it's also showing up on our web page um, sites, the, the Google uh, web page for TCS Plus. So um, maybe we can go around the table to introduce the groups. OK, yes. So we have a large number of groups today. Uh, so from Berkeley, we have uh, Antonio Blanco. From uh, Columbia University, we have a group led by Clement Gannon. Then we have a group by Job Priet from NYU. Hello. We have a single person from North Carolina, Kagola Krishnan. We have a group from Paris uh, led by Lila Fontes. Hello. We have a group from MIT led by Louis Woloch. Hi. We have a group led by Madhur Tulziani of TTIEC and U Chicago. Hello, Madhur. Then we have a group uh, from Caltech led by Piyush Srivastana. Hello. We have a group from uh, UCSD led by Shahar Lovit. And uh, yeah, that's, that's all we have. OK, so um, thanks, Thomas, and welcome, everyone. So before uh, we go on with today's talk, let me announce the upcoming talks for the remainder of the semester. So in a couple of weeks, we'll have Thomas Rodvos from University of Washington. Um, then after that, November 19th, will be Bernard Hoepler from CMU. And finally, we'll end the semester on December 3rd uh, with a talk by Mark Braverman uh, from Princeton University. But today, we are extremely pleased uh, to have Christos Papadimitriou uh, from UC Berkeley, uh, who's going to give us a talk on satisfiability and evolution. Um, so, so, so I don't think there's really any point in me introducing Christos, but uh, Christos has been a, is a professor at uh, Berkeley. And I, I was uh, looking at his uh, biography, and it turns out that Christos has eight, or maybe more since then, but eight honorary uh, PhDs from universities across the world. Uh, he's written many books. Um, so Christos is very well known for his work in algorithmic uh, game theory. Um, but I guess he's one of these persons who's you know, not satisfied to um, revolutionize an area, but he actually creates uh, new areas. And he's been doing um, this uh, at the interface of uh, computer science and biology in recent years, so with a lot of uh, very interesting work trying to understand evolution um, from a computational point of view. In particular, you know, various, various very interesting questions. In particular, um, he has some very nice work on the role of sex in evolution. But today, I think he's going to tell us about something a little bit uh, different. Um, so welcome, Christos. Uh, and uh, Hello. Uh, please go ahead. Um, we're very pleased to have you today. Oh, so thanks, Thomas. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me. And in fact, thanks uh, to the TCS Plus uh, team for what they're doing. Really, uh, thanks. Uh, this is an amazing work. Uh, it, uh, it's really TCS Plus. It uh, makes the theoretical computer science a better place, a more homogeneous uh, family. Uh, and uh, and uh, it deserves a lot of support uh, and gratitude. So thank you again. Uh, so, uh, coming to such ability and evolution, what can these uh, two things have in common? Incidentally, yesterday, less than 44, 48, 24 hours ago, I gave the same talk at Fox, but frankly, you are getting the better deal, okay? Because this is, this is uh, first of all, I debugged my talk yesterday, and, and, and uh, also there is a lot more detail here and substance. Good. So, what can these two things have in common? Uh, one is that uh, is that they were both pioneered by two brilliant uh, Englishmen of the Victorian era. Uh, you see, Bull and Darwin. 
Uh, but what else? So here, here is here are two quotes uh, on evolution from uh, uh, two very, uh, very famous, uh, uh, some of the two of the best uh, b top biologists of the previous century. Uh, Jacques Monod uh, uh, has said that one curious aspect of evolution is that everybody thinks he understands it, and I think that the same holds for satisfiability in some sense. For example, today I am going to uh, tell you a have very non-trivial fact about uh, very non-trivial and basic fact about satisfiability, which I, I bet you didn't know. Um, and uh, the second says that uh, evolution enjoys some kind of completeness. Okay, that nothing makes sense in life except in the light of evolution. So we have to understand it. Okay, it's not like something that we sh that 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 we that we, it's good to understand, but 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 you can't. Uh, you can't do anything without understanding it. Okay, so uh, cool. So uh, uh, let's, uh, you know, we have been talking about great biologists of the past century. This is another one. He's probably the greatest experimentalist. And uh, uh, so I'll describe an experiment of his. And uh, I think that, uh, that from this experiment, uh, you can see what a great experimentalist is, you know, you know, the, the thinking of a truly great experimentalist is very close to a thinking of a, of a truly great theoretician. Okay, so so let me let me let me let me go ahead with this experiment. Uh, so it's with flies. Uh, so what he did uh, sixty something years ago, he took a bunch of flies uh, at room temperature, and then uh, what he did is is he baked their larvae. In in uh, in uh, high in tropical temperature, and he noticed that something changed, something very subtle changed in their wings. Uh, their wings, they they uh, they uh, they you know, flies' wings, as you know, are supposed to have to be hatched, but uh, but thatched. But these were sort of you know were missing one of the directions of the thatching. So so that's uh, that uh, that was. Uh, uh, but I mean, no, I couldn't represent this in my picture. So imagine that their head turned red. Okay. Uh, so so uh, and 15 of them changed because of that. 15 percent. So what he did is uh, he selected those, threw away the others, and bred them, bred the red-headed ones. And uh, something very interesting happened. That uh, the second generation, 60 percent of them were changed. So what he did is he threw away the 40% that were not changed and, and bred those. 63% uh, changed. So, so it looked like it has topped off. It's at a plateau, but no. He continued for 20 generations, and in the end, so I'm giving you the essence of his experiments. There are some, some, uh, you know, uh, aspects that I'm that I'm not presenting, but uh, but uh, but but this is a this is really the essence of what happened. 99% had changed after 20 generations, and then. Waddington did something amazing. Uh, can you guess what he did? He lowered the temperature. And after lowering the temperature, uh, only 20% 20, 20 stayed changed. Uh, and uh, if you think about it, this is amazing. Okay, it means uh, it means something very strange. Okay, it means that uh, that uh, uh, something that was an adaptation of the environment, for example, you spend the summer in uh, in uh, in uh, a beach in Greece, and you return home uh, sunburned. Okay, you know it's 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 natural. Okay, now that your children are born sunburned, okay, so you know after 20 generations, that's that's very strange. Okay, I mean, you know, it's not supposed to happen. Okay, that that and, you know how can adaptation to the environment become genetic? Okay, this. Uh, is I mean, you know, we are we are delighted that 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 our French friends are, are listening because this is this um, uh, you know this is an image of an amazing uh, French geologist uh, named Jean Baptiste Lamarck, who had the distinct uh, terrible luck of uh, of uh, being remembered for his only mistake, and that's that that uh, that uh, uh, traits we acquire in our life during our lifetime can be. Bequeath can be inherited by our children. Okay, so uh, so this looks like Mar Lamarckianism, but actually, it's not. Okay, and uh, the challenge now, the intellectual challenge, 
as I'm going to show you, the mathematical challenge is to find a genetic explanation. Can you find a purely genetic explanation without some mysterious way in which in which you can inherit uh, so mutilations and such sort of you know that we experienced in our lifetime? All right. So imagine that this red phenotype depends on uh, a bunch of genes. Can consider these genes as Boolean zero one functions, plus another Boolean variable H, which stands for high temperature. So you have a function f of x h, x is a vector, where, which is precisely red. Okay, it tells you that 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 that, that uh, the fly is going to be red-headed. And uh, again, it's it's uh, boolean. And initially, suppose that these genes have uh, the alleles of these two alleles of the of the genes uh, are uh, alleles is a is a biology term meaning meaning variant of a gene. So these two alleles, I'll, I'll be using it a lot, uh, are, you, you know, the, the, the frequency of these alleles is uniform, have 50-50 in, in every gene, and uh, independent. And of course, there is no, uh, there is no temperature, there is no high temperature. Um, then, uh, uh, imagine the following now, that, uh, that, uh, Xi is one at, with probability pi, and we said that initially pi is uh, is half. What happens in the next generation? And I want you to think about it. I mean, in the next generation, what happens once you breed these uh, flies that have uh, that have uh, Xi equals one with probability pi? What is going to happen with high probability? Is that the genotype, you know, the probability of uh, Xi being one in the next generation, that's what I mean by prime, is essentially the conditional probability on the function f being uh, satisfied, because f is the condition under which these, uh, these flies survive to the next generation. And therefore, so this, this formula stands to reason, okay? Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, so, with this in mind, what do we want is a Boolean function, f depending on the vector of x and on the, on the single Boolean environmental variable h, with the following properties. Initially, when x is, uh, is uh, iid uniform, uh, distributed, then uh, f of x h and h, h equals 0, then, then, it's, then the probability is about 0%. Uh, if uh, we turn uh, h to 1, the probability should be 15%, like in Waddington's experiment. If now we select and breed, it should uh, rise sharply to 60%. Uh, and if we success successively breed, it should slowly converge to 99%, 200%, about 100%. And then, if we switch off the temperature, if we make this environmental variable 0, it should still stay high. Relatively high, so this is this is the these are the desiderata. Okay, the question is, can we find such a function? And it turns out that yes, okay, that uh, this function can be found, and it is the threshold function. Imagine that the red phenotype is the Boolean function that says that the sum of these ten Boolean variables plus three times the sum of the the Boolean variable h must be at least ten. So indeed. In, at zero generation, when h is zero, uh, uh, in order to have uh, to have this satisfied, you must have all ten Boolean variables uh, equal to one, and uh, that's uh, that's has probability very close to zero. But if you turn uh, h to one, notice that now this must be at least seven, okay? And uh, yeah, fifteen percent will be will have more than seven of these genes turned to one. And uh, then uh, you do the calculation. It's an interesting calculation. If uh, if now you take this 15% and you breed them, then what happens is the probability shoots up to 60%. That's that's sort of that's an interesting fact to remember, actually. You know, for probability. Uh, and then if you successfully successfully breed, what will happen is that the probability is going to slide higher and higher. Uh, and then it will, you know, it will be something like 80%. And of course, then 
almost all of them are going to have at least seven uh, 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 true variables. And finally, if you turn, you know, if you if you turn down the temperature, it's going to be 25 percent. So I was really pl very pleased with myself when I when I figured this out. But then somebody told me that 60 years ago, uh, an American biologist called Stern had uh, essentially done the same analysis in in a journal in a, in a biology journal. All right. So, uh, but let's take a step back. Okay, so we know. Uh, Evolution today, okay, so you know, so why are you interested in evolution? So one thing that I should uh, tell you is that evolution today is uh, is, a, is an amazing field, okay? It's 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 uh, probably as big as computer science. Uh, it's a powerful and, computer and prestigious theory. It's, of course, founded on the ideas of Darwin and Mendel, but it's also informed by sophisticated mathematical models uh, developed in the early 20th century, mostly population genetics. And currently, it is uh, suffering the deluge of a molecular data, which it's sort of struggling and, and, and scrambling to explain. Okay, so you know, and, and and it's not doing. You know, it's it, it's uh, in some sense, it's uh, it's a uh, field under attack from molecular data. Okay, so you know, it's both strengthening it and, and challenging it a lot. And uh, and it's an amazing sort of uh, 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 development of the last uh, 30 years that I'm not going to. Uh, talk much about is that it has also become an experimental science because there is this this uh, great experimental Richard Lensky in uh, in uh, in Michigan State uh, who is uh, running for the last past 30 years if I'm not mistaken an experiment with the evolution of E. coli so he he has colonies of E. coli uh, he uh, uh, subjects them to uh, Various forms of torture, like sort of you know radiation, chemical, uh, you know freezing, uh, hot uh, uh, chemicals, and so on, and then keeps every day uh, uh, a few specimens. And so now that that we have uh, that we have uh, uh, we can sequence genomes. He knows everything there is to know about this. Okay, so so and so in some sense he, he draws amazing conclusions, and, and then in some sense he has turned uh, uh, evolution into experimental science. But in any event, so that's what evolution is today. Uh, what is of interest to us is that there are ma amazing mysteries. Okay, as as Greg Valiant wants to say, <clears throat> the overarching mystery that encompasses all of them <clears throat> is the following. We don't understand evolution uh, enough. So, yeah. Can I interrupt for a moment? So actually, yes. there was a, a question a while back. Try to okay. to, to interrupt. You. Okay, um, sure. and if you go back a few slides, actually, there seems to be something strange happening in like this third generation because kind of first you have like this in the second generation, sixty percent changed of the yeah. of yeah. the, and then in the next one, sixty three percent changed. Yes. So there, there is some kind of. Uh, uh, weird plateau, right? That it kind of it goes up a lot to 60 and then just 63. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, yeah. is this correct? So, uh, so that's correct. And that's and that's uh, and that's something that 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 uh, that uh, you should be able to uh, to figure out uh, with with a piece of paper in 5 minutes. So it's it's a, it's a very simple phenomenon that has to do with the law of large numbers that you should expect it to be slightly above 50%. Like sixty percent, and then then it will not change much. It will it will it will plateau uh, s slowly to hundred percent. Okay. Okay. So by end end it's I mean, no, sorry, no. Uh, it's no. It does make sense to explain it. It's it's uh, it's easier. You know, it's 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 a much much better if if you if you see it yourself because it's very simple. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um. Okay, good. So, so let's go back to to, to evolution. Um, so, according to about fifty percent. Sorry, that was just an an, an interruption. Some feedback. To Greg Valley, you know, the, uh, in, in evolution. Sorry, in evolution. When when? Excuse me. I heard something. I'm continuing. Um, so the overarching mystery that, that encompasses all other mysteries is the following. Uh, 
or it's in some sense also a Turing test for evolution. When when are we as, as computer scientists going to have understood evolution adequately? Okay, when we are able to when we'll be able to tell if uh, evolution has been, you know, if we should be surprised that evolution is too successful, or we should be surprised that evolution is not successful enough as it has happened on Earth in the last three and a half billion years, okay? So that's in some sense, if you think about it, that's, 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 a, that's a very, very interesting quantitative goal for, uh, for what, you know, an ambitious quantitative goal for what, what we need to understand from evolution, okay? So, um, uh, but, I mean, you know, mysteries are abundant in evolution right now. Uh, what is the role of sex and recombination, okay? Believe it or not, the most, the most uh, mysterious, you know, some some people call it the queen of problems in evolution. Uh, the, the the greatest mystery in evolution is why we all have one mom and one dad. Okay, so you know, you know, why 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 don't we have just one mother? Okay, nothing else. Okay, why why is sex uh, ubiquitous? All right. And when I say ubiquitous, it's not ubiquitous among humans. Okay, it's ubiquitous in the tree of life. Okay, if you want to, if you look at the tree of life. There are there are a dozen or so asexual species that we know, and they are scattered in the leaves. Okay, the, the, and they come from sexual species that lost it. Okay, so uh, asexuality is very underrepresented in the tree of life. Okay, it's extremely unsuccessful, and uh, and sex is ubiquitous. So why? Okay, you know it has definite uh, disadvantages. Okay, for example, it dilutes your genetic uh, material that, that that your children inherit. Okay, it also breaks down successful combination. It does many many nasty things. Why do we have it around? Uh, another one is why there is some. Of course, I mean, you know, sex is here because because uh, because our brain uh, 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 loves it. Okay, but but the question is why. Is the Earth a better place for brains who love sex? Okay, you know that that's that's the true question. Uh, and uh, also, uh, why is there? I mean, you know, if if I take uh, you know if uh, if uh, if uh, we sequence uh, two human uh, genomes, okay, we'll find that they agree on they disagree on about three percent of uh, the nucleotides of the bases, and that's uh, very strange because theory predicts that uh, sort of you know. Uh, less than about one in a thousand. Okay, so why is that? I mean, it's an order or two of magnitude difference. And third, how do complex traits emerge? Okay, so you know, this scared Darwin a lot. Okay, Darwin would say that uh, to this day, the eye gives me a short, the eye gives me a short thunder, thudder, a shudder, because you realize the eye is a very complex uh, organ. I mean, how do you get the eye? But forget the eye. You know what is the most complex organ you have? Uh, or some of you have, okay, you know, or some of you will have, okay, is, is, uh, is the placenta, okay? Uh, uh, the placenta is, uh, is, uh, was, uh, pro, you know, uh, happened uh, 65 million years ago. Without the placenta, we would all be kangaroos, okay? Uh, uh, and, and, but the placenta happened uh, 65 uh, million years ago. And it took the conspiracy of 1,500 genes, okay, of our genome, of the mammalian genome, of the of the uh, 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 marsupial mammalian genome, to uh, create uh, the placenta, okay. And uh, how did this happen, okay? How did this emerge, okay? So imagine that by luck, by chance, these genes had been around, okay. How did uh, the population sense that these were interesting genes? And how did how did it uh, sort of uh, uh, end up uh, having all the right alleles? Okay, that, that's that's actually a very very deep mystery, and this is basically the mystery that I'm going to talk about today. Because going back to Waddington's experiment, the red phenotype related to the last mystery seems to be a particular complex, multigenic, many genes evolved trait. Which actually does emerge, okay? Of course, in the experiment, it it uh, it uh, it um, uh, emerges because of the experimental design. But I mean, oh, can we do better? And uh, how about generalizing? Suppose that we have an arbitrary Boolean function of genes, and there is no environmental variable. Um, suppose that the satisfying genotypes have a small fitness advantage. In other words, by fitness we mean usually in, in evolution the expected offspring of the of this particular genotype. So you know, imagine that this have have expected offspring one plus epsilon instead of one. Okay. 
uh, and as opposed to the zero one advantage uh, that that was due to the experimental design by Waddington. And the question is, will this trait be fixed eventually? Okay, that's this is the question I want I want I want to pursue. So, um, Christos, sorry, yeah, can I ask yeah. just one question? So, the sure. the fitness again, maybe you said this. This is the number of offspring, the yes. expected number of offspring. Okay. Yes. And and this epsilon. Um, how do you want us to think of it? Like, is uh, it as, you know, as small, one as, small as, as as small as as uh, for example, one or less than one over the number of genes. One over two, the number of genes is small enough. Oh, so it's extremely small. Okay. It has to be small. Yeah. Uh, I'll talk. I'll talk a lot about this epsilon. Okay. Okay. Sure. Uh, so now, uh, this formula for updating uh, the 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 percentage, the the probability of I, of xi being true from one generation to the next, becomes a little more uh, dif different in order sort of you know in order to accommodate this uh, jump from zero one to one to one plus epsilon, and this is the approximate for this is the formula. Uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the, that we have now, and you know, if you th if you if you curb your ambition to just monotone functions, and uh, then you think that xi must has some influence, then it's easy to see that uh, in the next generation, pi prime is going to be very slightly bigger than uh, pi, and after you know, it cannot be double exponentially bigger, it has to be exponentially, one over exponentially bigger. So after exponentially many steps, we should be done. So yes, it works with monotone functions. And uh, the point is that we have an interesting theorem here, that you don't need exponentially many steps, you need linearly many steps. And the theorem, which is sort of used by, 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 uh, by Boolean Fourier analysis, uh, is that uh, 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 n over epsilon times sigma zero steps suffice, where uh, sigma zero is the initial satisfaction probability. Okay, so one thing to sort of you know to to uh, fix to make sure we all understand one thing. This talk is not about uh, heuristics for satisfiability. Okay, if it was about heuristic satisfiability, I would not talk about monotone functions. These are distinctly unimpressive. Benchmarks for heuristics for satisfiability. Okay, so uh, uh, and this is uh, and this is actually uh, uh, and actually sort of you know I, for, I forgot to mention this this bound is the best possible and tribes which is the, the Boolean function that has sort of you know extremely small influence of all variables. This uh, tribes is that makes it makes it work. But let me uh, let me have a parenthesis about the genetic algorithms. These, uh, it is this, it's trying to, you know, my obsession with understanding why these algorithms prefer perform so badly. This really led me to study, to the study of evolution. And uh, it's, it's an amazing mystery because in life, sex is successful and ubiquitous. Then why do genetic algorithms perform so poorly when compared to simulated annealing? What is the reason? And the answer is that evolution is not a good metaphor for heuristics. Okay, in a heuristic, what you want to do is to create a population in which some of the individuals are outstanding. This is your goal in a heuristic. In evolution, your goal is to create. In evolution, you have no goal, but what evolution is successful at is creating good populations. Okay, these are two very different goals. All right, and in some sense. Uh, Genetic algorithms are in the wrong business. Okay, they are not good at creating populations with outstanding individuals. They are good at creating outstanding populations. Okay, so the you know the hope for genetic algorithms, the domain of of application, should be uh, uh, optimization problems that we want, for which we want robust solutions. Where we don't know the 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 uh, very well the uh, uh, objective function, if they have multiple objectives, if they have time varying objectives. So, in fuzzy, so to speak, optimization problems, maybe maybe a genetic algorithm would work well, but not in uh, the optimization sharp optimization problems that we, you and I know. All right, and it turns out 
and that's that's sort of in our first result in this in this series of papers that sex is a medio mediocre optimizer of fitness okay it's not it's not if you if fitness is your only goal uh, uh, sex is the wrong is the wrong uh, medium all right uh, okay back to monotone functions so here is something that that is worth talking about because it's it's at the basis of what we do why are we assuming a product distribution isn't there correlation in genetics? Of course, there is genetic correlation. It's called genetic linkage, okay? And a lot of a lot of this correlation comes from the fact that uh, mom and dad had chromosomes, and we inherited these chromosomes in bunches, okay? So there is there is uh, there is uh, uh, there is correlation, but this is sort of you know a, a not very a very useful kind of correlation. So, you know, in some sense, it's superficial kind of correlation. The real correlation that I want to study here, that we, that we are interested in here, is correlation due to selection. Okay. Uh, uh, sorry, Christos. Uh, yeah. I have, yeah, yeah. Going back to the genetic, genetic algorithm underperforming. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, genetic algorithms have some success stories themselves, right? For example, like, let's say, there's been, like, some competitions for finding, like, the best route that visits like many planets, like uh, let's say from ESA and NA, and yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. the winning. So, do you have any sort of like idea of why uh, or which kind of optimization problems, for example, uh, I mean, genetic algorithms, let's say, truly underperform, like simulate annealing? I mean, that's uh, so here's, so like, here's what I here's what I know. Okay, so you know, and 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 you, uh, and of course, you know, so you know, uh, ten thousand papers are written every day, and like, uh, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not aware of everything. All right, I mean, no. But what I know, and what I have known for like twenty years, and had been bothering me a lot, is that uh, there are many practical important problems like placement and interconnecting chips, for which practitioners swear by. Uh, by by simulate annealing, and uh, genetic algorithms are the most attractive algorithms. Every time you mention it to somebody, their eyes light up, and then they think that they're going to go to their lab and program it, and in a week they're going to have a fantastic results. And two months later, they come with their head down. Okay, uh, and you know, I am not aware of uh, a true problem where a real Important problem where a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, approaches have been, uh, but uh, as I told you, maybe 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 I'm, I'm uninformed. Uh, a lot of approaches have uh, uh, been tried in earnest, and uh, the genetic algorithms came on top. Uh, so this this is my claim. Uh, now, uh, uh, frankly, uh, I'm satisfied that this mystery is solved. Okay, and and the solution to this mystery. Is uh, is uh, the sentence I told you before that uh, that uh, evolution is good at creating good populations, where in heuristics we look in heuristics for practical important problems. What we are looking for is populations with outstanding individuals. Okay, so that's. Uh, 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 but I mean, I'm not expecting to resolve here any sort of. Uh, Dispute uh, between 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 heuristics. Okay, so uh, uh, I just uh, told you my my own my own uh, my own point of view. Okay, so going back to going back to correlation. Okay, excuse me. Sorry, I have another question uh, related to what you showed about monotone functions. So, does the proof also work if you don't assume epsilon to be small? Because intuitively that should help. But uh, I guess the first step you. I mean, yes. Like I mean, so, so uh, 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 this uh, uh, okay for monotone functions, it would work. Okay. So, 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 but I mean, no, epsilon, epsilon. Uh, you know, this epsilon, I'm going, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, to talk about a lot uh, uh, when I talk about general functions. Uh, yeah. So I believe that it should work for uh, for larger epsilon. Okay. So, so the the bounds on epsilon come from elsewhere. Not for monotone functions. All right. So let. So how about linkage? How about correlation? So correlation has two sources. One is chromosomes. Forget about that. It's not. It's not. It's not very important. Uh, it's important for many reasons, like like uh, uh, sleuthing uh, uh, genetic diseases. But but it's not important for uh, for our purposes here. Uh, 
And but I mean, oh, there is another correlation that comes from selection, and that's important for when 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 you study evolution. Okay, imagine the following. Imagine that there are two genes in our chromosome that uh, uh, they have two alleles, and the two alleles must be the same alleles in order for us to be fertile. Okay. So in other words, imagine that the fitness function has a clause that says that x1 must be equal to x2. Okay. So you okay, your mom had zero zero or one one. And your dad also had 0, 0, and 1, 1, because obviously they were fertile, okay? Uh, the question is, are you fertile? What's the probability that you are fertile? It, you know, since uh, we are assuming that the, prob the, the, the marginal probability of both, uh, of both x1 and x2 is 50-50, your, uh, it should, you know, if, if there was no correlation, it should be half, right? I mean, uh, but, but it's not, because it's three quarters. Uh, if uh, your... Uh, both your mom and your dad were either both zero zero or both one one. You are fertile for sure. But if they were uh, zero, if they were not, one was zero zero, another was one one. Again, you have a half chance of being of being fertile. Okay, so 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 you have uh, three quarters, and the linkage disequilibrium, which basically means the distance between the product distribution and the true distribution, the L one distance, is one eighth. Okay, and. Uh, uh, sorry, the infinity distance is one eight, uh, and uh, so uh, that's uh, so. This is this is uh, this is a threat to our formalism so far, but uh, there is a beautiful theorem due to a, a population geneticist called Thomas Nagilaki from Chicago, uh, who proved uh, 20 years ago that after log n generations, the if the selection strength, epsilon, which is the maximum difference in fitness, which you assume to be small, is small, then the leakage of the equilibrium is also small. And I want to give you sort of, you know, a sense for the proof, and the, the basic idea in the proof. And that's the following. That imagine that, uh, that, uh, that the, that the, uh, oops, uh, 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 okay, so uh, I I failed. Um, uh, so let me leave it here, and it's going to hi slightly hide uh, a little of the picture, and I'll, I'll move my head a little to the right. Uh, okay, so so this is three again. Uh, this is this is the tree of your ancestors. You are up here. And you are you are you are just you know you you want to, you want to trace n genes, and uh, imagine that you are just in gene three. Okay, what happens? Did you get it from your mom or from your dad? Suppose you got it from your mom. Where did she get it from? Maybe from her mom. Where did she get it from? And so on and so on and so on. Three three log n generations. Where did he get it from? From his dad. Okay, let's stop. Hold hold it right there. Who is this person? Okay, this person is a random person from three log n generations ago, okay? And if you trace your genes again and again for n times, you are never going to see this person again, okay? Because this is, uh, you know, you have, there are too many ancestors. And as a result, you are indeed sampling from uh, the distribution, okay? So it is a product distribution, okay? Well, this is accurate when there is no selection. If there is, if there is selection, then, uh, uh, Sample is not quite uniform because uh, going back, you don't sample uniformly. For example, if one of the people in the populations are sterile, therefore certainly they are going to be your ancestors. Uh, but b because now we're talking about small differences, not sterility, and an epsilon bias is introduced in every generation. Therefore, after log n generations, the the uh, the linkage disequilibrium is at most order of epsilon log n. And the analysis of Nagilaki's theorem gets rid of the log n factor. Okay, that's that's the bottom line. And uh, so our assumption of product distribution is satisfied. And uh, and uh, uh, it's okay to assume product distribution, especially because Nagilaki's theorem applies. And so we can go back to our question of arbitrary Boolean functions. 
And indeed, the theorem says that it holds for ar arbitrary Boolean functions. So let me state, give a rough sketch, and then I'll, I'll go through a rough statement, and then I'll go through what everything means. Any Boolean function of genes which confers a small evolutionary advantage will be eventually fixed with high probability with polynomial population and number of generations. Unfortunately, every word is well chosen here, okay? And I'm going to explain why. Um, as stated, this theorem is wrong, okay? Because imagine that your function is XOR, okay? Basically, I just realized that there is no XOR in, 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 my, in my PowerPoint, so I used the uh, different, okay? But you know what I mean. Uh, imagine that you have the XOR function. What will happen if we start uniform? Will stay put, okay? We'll never nothing change, okay? We're not going to improve our so so that that's does hold for uniform functions, not just for for, for the XOR function, not just XOR. If in more generally we have the function exactly k out of n Boolean variables are true, and we start with uh, with uniform uh, in the IID uh, k over n, uh, again we're going to st stay put. So it turns out that the result fails in the, fails in the infinite population approximation, and so we must somehow uh, uh, do finite populations. So we must state it and prove it in finite populations. Uh, so and here is how we do it. The precise statement is the following. The process we are describing is that to form the next generation, first we sample for the current product distribution to create a real population in the previous generation, n individuals, where n is some huge number, polynomial though, and we let the empirical population be QI, and then we apply the selection on top of this, and this gets you a stack from the XOR. And then you apply the selection, uh, and uh, applying the, 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 the formula that, that we know and love. Uh, so let me tell you about the parameters. N is the number of genes involved. Sigma zero is the initial satisfaction probability, which must be, must be substantial. Epsilon uh, is the selection strength, must be very small, and I'll talk about that immediate, immediately. Uh, N is a population which is polynomial in the number of genes and, and the initial satisfaction probability. T is the number of gen generation which is also polynomial. And the failure probability is uh, at most two over n. Okay. Why does why is, why does the selection have to be small? So, which is this is bizarre? Why does a theorem about the effectiveness of selection fails when the selection is strong? The intuitive explanation is the following: In the interior of the cube, the process is close to gradient descent, and gradient descent, as we know. It's hard to analyze when the step is large, okay? That's why we had to keep epsilon very small, all right? Okay. The main open problem, that we call it Greg's conjecture, not that the rest of us don't subscribe by it, but, but Greg is more, more effective in propagandizing it. The result remains true even if the fitness is 0, 1, okay, for an epsilon, when epsilon is infinity. And uh, uh, the, there is evidence from experiments, uh, and... Uh, of course, uh, Nagilaki's theorem does not uh, provide satisfaction justification here. So this is, in some sense, more closer to a to a result about uh, uh, Boolean functions than about evolution. Uh, but it's it's a very very interesting, very intriguing, and I believe very very uh, beautiful conjecture. Good. So let me tell you a few things about ma the main theorem, uh, about the proof. Uh, we want to show that the sample select uh, cycle leads to a satisfying population. We track the, ex the expected fitness, f of p, where p, p is, the, is the expectation, okay? And the chorus of the proof is the following. We bound the variance introduced by sampling, okay? So we want to bound the variance introduced by sampling by the expected fitness increase in the selection step. So this is, remember how the sampling works. How, how sort of you know the selection step works, and basically what we want to prove is that uh, this uh, the expected under Q, uh, every all expectations under under Q, the 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 the, uh, the empirical distribution of of the sample, uh, uh, you know the variance introduced uh, in the sampling step uh, is lost, you know is bounded. Uh, 
well, uh, somehow, sort of, you know, in a, a not so good way, by uh, by the by the uh, effect, by the expectation of uh, of the of the fitness improvement. Uh, so that's the variance introduced. That's the fitness increase, and that tells you that uh, epsilon must be small. This this is the denominator, okay? Uh, because if it's big, then 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 we're out of business. Uh, Wait, okay. Chris. Yeah. Sorry, there's no square or anything on the right hand side. This um, no. this thing can be negative or uh, this thing cannot be negative because because you go in you, know, you go up. I mean, you know, if you see if you look up, yeah, if if you look up, this is this is uh, this is uh, the, you know it has a positive term, right? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, so you're still with monotone functions here? No, 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 no. Okay. We are not. We are not. But the, you know, it's just the probability. Uh, you know, it's. Uh, you know, the, 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 it's it's the, you know uh, it's the you know uh, what what is in this in these brackets is this term here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so to continue the proof, uh, we have to do this. How do we do it? Uh, basically, uh, we stick in between a rather unexpected quantity. Which is uh, uh, the linear mass of the Q bias Fourier transform of f. Okay, uh, so basically we have to show that this biases by a lot the variance introduced, and it's somewhat uh, smaller than than uh, than uh, the, than the increase in fitness. Okay, and uh, both of these are are uh, true theorems. Uh, uh, and uh, so, how do you do the first step? Uh, the first step, uh, what you basically have to do is uh, is uh, so. The first step is 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 uh, is uh, uh, is based on uh, biased uh, Boolean Fourier analysis. Uh, is totally takes place in the Fourier domain. Uh, and it's it's uh, sort of you know it's quite quite uh, you know it's it's a few pages of of, of math. Uh, the uh, second step, the second the second inequality, is a little easier to explain. Uh, uh, in some sense, as I told you, uh, away from the boundary of the cube, the process is very close to uh, to gradient descent. We know that uh, that the square uh, uh, singular the uh, singleton coefficient of 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 uh, of, uh, of the Fourier coefficient is uh, essentially captures the the descent the, the descent step the derivative of of the partial derivative of of that of that of that uh, uh, in that particular direction, but we have a problem that. Uh, 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 you know the, the st steepest descent is not is not the sum of uh, of steps along 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 uh, the axis, okay, uh, along partial derivatives, uh, because partial der derivatives change uh, change along that. So we have to do a step by step approximation, and that's sort of familiar to those who have analyzed uh, have analyzed the steepest descent in the past. But here is where we get this one minus n epsilon uh, uh, denominator, which of course uh, you know so sorry. First of all, this is done without expectations. It's done in the in it's point by point, and this gives us the one minus n epsilon uh, because uh, because uh, uh, you have to do n steps of approximation. Okay, you have to go uh, through uh, uh, each partial derivative in row in a row, and each such such uh, partial derivative uh, uh, introduce an error which I can best approximate by epsilon, and and there goes our our, our um, an epsilon uh, factor in the denominator. Uh, okay, and uh, so this concludes the proof of this part, which is sort of the core of the proof. Uh, next, uh, uh, you have to you have to show that the total effect of the variance steps is small. Okay, uh, uh, and and uh, and basically the idea is that that the that the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the sum, you know, the the sum of the of the different of, of the of the of the increase in fitness is a martingale, but unfortunately has no obvious upper bound, 
And so we need a very exotic uh, uh, martingale inequality that we had to dug, dig out from the literature somewhere. And uh, as a result of this inequality, increase prevails, and uh, therefore the process will get unstuck from spurious fixed points like the XOR fixed point. Uh, finally, the process gets so close to the boundary that uh, increase is minuscule, and you cannot argue in, ter in terms of increase. But then it's a random walk, and of course it's a random walk with absorbing boundaries, because this is the key difference for the game theorists in the audience between game theory and evolution, that uh, that uh, that out of the support in evolution means extinction, okay? And extinction is forever, and if this particular gene goes extinct, it will never come back, okay? So uh, a random walk with absorbing boundaries, and will eventually get stuck at the vertex of the cube, and that's the end of the proof. Okay, so I hope I hope I gave you sort of you know, a good idea of what how this theorem is proved. One one last thing, I mean, you know, this last step shows us that all diversity is lost. In other words, in the end, we go to one particular vertex of the cube. Okay, that's sort of surprising. I mean, because we know that that diversity is is is, is the is the essence of life. Well, listen, okay. One thing that I that 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 will be surprising to you once I, I point it out is that so far we have been doing evolution without mutation. Okay, so all these powerful techniques, okay, don't need mutations to work, and in some sense this is their power. During this time, mutations will have occurred. Okay, uh, okay, so 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 uh, evolution does lose diversity. But then mutations replenish it, and life goes on. Okay, so there is nothing surprising about the fact that our our proof uh, uh, ends up in the in the in the vertex of the cube. All right. Uh, okay. So what have I shown you? I've shown you a uh, an interesting and non-trivial algorithmic fact about satisfiability that has hanging from it a very interesting conjecture. Uh, the parameter bound should be very improvable, especially the, the time bound. Uh, the monotone functions, are, the bound is essentially tight, and there is, uh, you know, uh, Rocco, uh, Rocco and, and Li Yang tell me that uh, that there is hope for uh, for threshold functions. That, that I mean, that, that we know how to that they know how to improve it for for uh, for uh, uh, for uh, threshold functions, uh, which is a special case, of course, of monotone. And how about uh, implications for evolution? This is an interesting new me mechanism for the emergence of complex traits, okay? So uh, I told you that how complex traits emerge is one of the mysteries of evolution. And uh, evolution theorists did not know about this mechanism. And it is, I think, a very interesting and new mechanism about, about the emergence of complex traits. Um, and it's impossible without sex, okay? That, uh, that you cannot, you know, this, uh, you know, first of all, Waddington's experiment, you realize, is impossible without sex. And since we are generalizing Waddington's experiment, what we do is impossible without sex. Um, uh, so it does shed some light to the mystery of, uh, of uh, the role of sex in evolution. Uh, sort of, you know, I convinced you that it's okay to work in this soup of alleles model, okay? Uh, and the question is, is the supervalent model the productive computational metaphor for studying evolution under sex? So I believe so. I believe that this sort of, uh, by supervalence is that, forget it, forget correlation, forget uh, linkage, forget everything, okay? What you have is a population, and what a population means, it's gene frequencies, allele frequencies, nothing else, nothing else matters. Okay, I believe you're very productive. A lot of things happen here. Okay, um, and uh, uh, for example, let me tell you a theorem that uh, that uh, a bunch of people, uh, Eric Chastain from Rutgers, Adil Livnat from Virginia Tech, myself and my my colleague Umesh Vazirani proved uh, recently. So it's sort of a, a sort of strikingly different way to look at evolution. That evolution under sex is that amount tant amount to a repeated coordination game played by genes. The strategies are the alleles, okay? So uh, imagine that basically what genes doing in evolution is the following. They sit around playing a repeated game. In this repeated game, what they are minding is their investment 
in allele frequencies, okay? They want to sort of uh, strategize how to invest in allele frequencies. And the utility is fitness, okay? They, this, they, it's, this is a coordination game. This is not the selfish gene uh, metaphor of Dawkins, okay? It's the community-minded gene. They all have the same, the same, uh, 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 the same uh, goal, except they are, they are cognitively challenged, so, so they have to play a strange protocol, okay? The utility is fitness, the common utility, and the game is played through multiplicative weights, okay? So the, 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 uh, the algorithm that we discovered and love, okay? So, you know, this is, being, this is what genes play in this game, okay? So this is, I think, a very, very interesting way of, of understanding uh, 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 evolution. And uh, recently, other computer scientists have uh, built on this, have done some very interesting work, on 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 uh, on uh, uh, under, on understanding evolution in this under this lens and uh, and uh, research is going on. Uh, okay, evolution and TCS. Okay, the three mysteries of evolution. What is the rule of sex? Why there is so much genetic diversity within species? And how do complex traits emerge? I think it's amazing that TCS has important important contributions to make to all three, and I believe that the game has just started. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So we can take questions. Um, unmute yourselves and, uh, and ask your questions to Christos. So yes, I have a question, if I may. So so you explained you explained us this this how this works with evolution. Now now I wonder whether kind of there could be even a better mechanism than sex for say the evolution of, of complex traits or or kind of it, it, would it be possible to show for example that, that sex might be the best way of doing it or, or what do you but that's a wonderful question I love it okay uh, and it's a relevant question okay in, 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 in the following sense uh, relevant, okay. Not that you can do anything, okay. You know, but but relevant in the following sense: that uh, there are these people now who believe, sort of, you know, now we are going to really deep water, uh, origins of life and so on, okay. That uh, that what we see now is the, the version of life that won, okay. Uh, I personally believe, and there are others who do, that that uh, sex was primordial. That uh, sort of, you know. As soon as there was RNA life, they started exchanging genes. Okay, they started exchanging genetic material. Uh, that sex, sex has all, had always been alive, been around. Okay, not always, maybe not three and a half million billion years, maybe three billion years. Okay, but it was, had been there from the almost the very beginning. Okay, and so, I mean, there are these people who believe that uh, uh, life was impossible before three and a half billion years. Okay. You know, probably 3.8 billion years, it was completely impossible. As soon as it became possible, it emerged. Is this a coincidence? Is this luck? Or is it that life emerged many times, many versions of life? And what we see now is the one that ate the rest, okay? And, 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 uh, and uh, so, you know, what other mechanisms did the other lives have, okay? And why did did the life we have now, which probably at, le at least early enough had sex, uh, why why uh, included sex? Uh, because we realize sex does not mean genders. Okay, bacterial are uh, are uh, are uh, incredibly sexual. Okay, so you know they they they, they exchange. You know, so there are some species of bacteria that uh, advertise their their DNA. Uh, here's what I have. What do you have? Okay, you know, and 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 uh, you know, in, in the in the in their membranes. Okay, so so that you know, that's that's uh, 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 so well, sex existed, of course, way before in sing single single cell animals, before eukaryotes and so on. Okay, and of course, genders is just an interesting interesting postscriptum in the in the history of sex. Okay, you know, it's it's not uh, 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 it's not uh, it's not uh, uh, it, has not, it was not essential at all. Uh, just, just an interesting, very sophisticated mechanism. Uh, so, uh, so it, so it is very interesting to ask uh, what other mechanisms are possible, and uh, why, why, you know, why did uh, sex uh, presumably beat them out, beat the, beat everything? Okay, and and and, and why was uh, was more more successful? 
yeah, I don't know. You know, so so it's it's a very interesting theoretical question. Mm. But we are theoreticians, so so it should be a shame of breaking up breaking up um, theoretical questions. Other questions? Actually, I have a question. Hi, Dad. Uh, hi, Chris. Um, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, just one. Uh, I'm not sure if it makes sense, but uh, you saying your analysis um, uh, points out that there's maybe something that does not work when epsilon is bigger than 1 over n. Is it just an artifact of the analysis, or do you think it might actually indicate something in nature, something you can experimentally verify? Um, good, great question. Uh, it's certainly an artifact of an analysis. Uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, I mean, uh, we know that, that, that very, very, Powerful that, that strong selection works. Okay, uh, that's why we're around. Okay, so 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 uh, our analysis works for very subtle, very slow selection, very weak selection. Um, we know that slow, that slow, that that fast, uh, that 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 uh, that uh, how do you call it? Uh, strong selection certainly works. Okay, so sort of, you know if you if you if uh, if uh, if a meteorite falls and sort of you know, and and, and uh, if there is a meteorite impact and 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 your uh, and your uh, fertility sad suddenly goes to zero, you're out, okay? You know, and 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 uh, these stupid uh, critters called mammals, okay, sort of you know, uh, are going to conquer the world, okay? Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, but uh, uh, I mean. And of course, I remind you that Greg believes that uh, the, you know we believe that uh, we have this as a conjecture in our paper that uh, our analysis also works where you know, not our analysis our theorem also works when when uh, when the selection when epsilon is infinity, uh, but uh, but uh, and that's I think that's a very interesting theorem. Okay, that that will be a very interesting theorem that uh, that there are no stable equilibria. Uh, of the of this very well defined process now, uh, outside of the corners of the of the hypercube. Okay, you know that that's that, that's that, that's a very interesting theorem, but uh, but we can't prove it. Okay, we cannot we cannot uh, uh, we have uh, you know Greg has done a, a, a truckload of experiments you know about that. Okay, but but uh, but uh, 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 but of course we are mathematicians. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. We have more questions. Maybe we should. F I had a very mildly technical question. I don't know if you still have time, Chris. Okay. Sure. It's not a technical question. I was just wondering about this product distribution assumption. So you. You tried to convince us that it it, it was fine. Um, you know, in, in the ideal parameters that you study, uh, you can assume that it's that the, the that this distribution on alleles is product. Um, but um, so I'm assuming this is really important for your proof. Um, like the, the, of the course. Of arguments. Of course. Um, but on the other hand, it sounds like if you did allow non-product distributions, then you could, you know, s see some interesting things that that you're not seeing. Um, of right course. now, did you of just course. so? Of course. Of course. Um, and for all I know, sort of, you know, it's uh, it's so nice to work with vectors. Okay, so you know, uh, and 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 that's you know that's why that's why we we uh, we assume product distribution. But of course, uh, I mean, you know, if we had a handle to the to the to the whole uh, sort of you know to the to the core correlated cor cor correlated uh, uh, probability matrix. I would be ecstatic. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, I agree with you. And there's no. Um, is there any model that uh, maybe biologists have been studied or other people have been studied where you'd have some, you know, you'd allow for some weak uh, form of correlation? And, of course, um, of course. No, no, no. Uh, so, uh, like, like his theorem is uh, is uh, is one. I mean, you know, if you you take if you get a book of population genetics, okay. Uh, Nagilaki's theorem will be there, 
but basically it is a spot of light that says, listen, when this is weak, you, your life is simpler, all right? And uh, we grabbed it, all right? But uh, the point is that a lot of the a lot of the analysis and sort of you know and very hard analysis comes in the correlated case. Okay, then usually you assume that you only have two genes because otherwise you sort of you know uh, things become really hairy. Or uh, what you end up assuming is something which I believe is a worse assumption. Okay, you assume that genes don't interact that the contributions to genes to fitness are additive okay sort of you know that uh, and uh, this i believe is an assumption that betrays the meaning of that that is, is uh, treachery you know it betrays the meaning of, of evolution much more than the weak than the weak uh, selection assumption okay that uh, that i believe that uh, evolution uh, is about the interplay of genes. Okay, it's you know it's not like genes are independent and they have an independent contribution to fitness, and uh, and sort of you know a lot of a lot of work. I mean, you know, there is there is uh, there is a work there is a word in biology called epistasis. It's a very it's a very common word, and this mean epistasis means uh, basically departure from additivity. Okay. And the implication is that it's usually tiny, okay? That every gene has a contribution, and then there is epistasis, okay? So you know, and and, and the most for the most uh, most of discussion we ignore it, uh, and sometimes we focus on it, but still we think of it as small, and uh, and I believe that this is uh, more of a betrayal of of the of the of the of the of the how do you call it of the of the spirit of evolution, of the essence of evolution, of what is important in evolution, my personal belief. Uh, because there are books on books about 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 the additive model, okay, uh, than than the weak selection assumption, which leads you soon through Nagilaki's theorem to to multiplicative uh, to to product distributions. Do I make sense? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, any last question? Anyone? Okay. Well, if not, um, you know, let's thank the speaker again. I guess uh, not everyone uh, hard to hear the claps, but thanks a lot for the talk, Christos. Thank um, you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, Thomas, maybe we can stop the live thing. Yes. Uh, thanks um, everyone for uh, watching on YouTube as well. We had uh, roughly 25 viewers, up to 30. Um, this time, and I hope uh, everybody will join again in two weeks. Who again? Thomas is the speaker in two weeks. Two weeks. Thomas Rothvoss will tell us about uh, discrepancy minimization in convex sets. I think. Okay. But so it's Thomas Rothvoss from University of uh, Washington. Okay. So see everyone in two weeks. Thanks a lot.